Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, a podcast all about tabletop role-playing games from the perspective of the captain's chair. This episode is brought to you by Texas Beard Company. Use the coupon code Game Master for a 15% discount at texasbeardcompany.com. Today, I'll reopen some discussion on episodes 40 and 41 with some enlightening comments from listeners of the show. So join me on the journey. Together, we can become Game Masters truly worthy of the title. Hello, listener and fellow GM and or player, welcome to episode 43 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker, and I'm really excited to be doing another episode today. And this is going to be a different episode from what I've done in the past. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. As promised in last week's episode, I'm trying to bring in more of the feedback that I get from you throughout the week into the show and ideas from lots of GMs out there. I can't promise to mention everybody on the show unless this is all I do every episode. It's just too much to to get to everything, but I am going to try to do more uh, from here on out of of bringing this stuff into the show. So I got quite a few really good comments on the last couple episodes, episode 40, which was about elegance in RPGs, and episode 41, which is where I talked about when I watched uh, Will Wheaton's Titan's Grave actual play on Geek and Sundry, and how I kind of learned some things to apply to my game mastering from watching him run a game. So I got some really great feedback about those things and I'm really excited to share it with you. I want to thank a few people who left me reviews on iTunes. And again, leaving a review on iTunes is a great way that you can help support this podcast without having to spend any money. It just takes a little bit of your time. So first off, I want to thank Mr. Chris Bridges for his five-star review and Chris says I am a new GM I've played RPGs for years but just started GMing and this has been a huge help I love the world building episodes I am going into the deep end and creating my own world so thank you so much for having this well you are welcome Chris and thank you for the review And I'm really glad that that the show is helping you as a new GM. That makes me super happy because that's kind of what this show is about. I I don't know that I specifically thought to myself when I created the show that, you know, I want to help new GMs. But I mean, that's really what it's about. You know, this show is all about GMs getting together and comparing notes and learning from one another so that we can all become better GMs. So, yeah, it's great for people that are GMing for the first time uh, to have kind of a source of information and insight. And not just from me, but from all the listeners who write in and, and when I share what you have to say and from guests that I have on the show. So that's awesome. And I'm also really happy that you're enjoying the world building episodes. I talked last week about how. I wasn't sure how those would go over and if they would really be useful to people. So I'm really glad that Chris, at least, is finding them useful. And kudos to you, sir, for building your own world, jumping into Deep End for sure, um, starting GMing for the first time and building your own world at the same time. But honestly, it's the best way to go. I've had a lot of fun playing in published worlds and playing published adventures and all that. But the best adventures I've ever run and the best sessions I've ever played in were always original stuff by the DM, you know, always original adventures and usually in an original world. So that's awesome that you're just jumping in. Definitely stay in touch and let me know how it goes. Um, And if you want to kind of share some of your experiences with your first few games and how that went. I'd be happy to share it with the listeners because I'm sure you're not the only person out there 
who's GMing for the first time or maybe considering GMing for the first time. I also want to thank Groshnik for your five-star review on iTunes. And Groshnik says, I started with GM Intrusions and moved to Game Master's Journey. Good, that's a great way to do it. Because I appreciate the author's point of view, supported with details and facts. It gives a different kind of look into other gaming systems than an actual play. I prefer to do research on a system before I invest, and this podcast is high on my pre-approval list. Thank you, Groshnik. That's that's high praise. Um, that's that's really humbling that uh, that I'm on your pre-approval list. That that's awesome, and I'm the same way. I like to definitely research a system in a game before I buy into it, as you said. So thank you, Groshnik, for your review. I'm, I'm really glad that, that I'm helping you, you know, kind of get a glimpse in the new systems you might want to try. And hopefully as time goes on with this show, it's even going to be better for that as I cover more systems as time goes on. And finally, I want to thank Malicious Wolf for your five star review on iTunes, who says exactly what I've been looking for for years. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Malicious Wolf. And this is a great example of a review. I mean, you don't have to write a, a book or even a paragraph, two sentences, um, but it still tells someone looking at this that, hey, this is something I might want to check out. Um, so that's awesome uh, that you finally found what you've been looking for for years. I definitely know how that is. So I'm really glad that, that this is working for you and, and scratching your itch. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for the reviews. And it's not just a thing of helping me as a podcast like reach more listeners it's also just really encouraging it's very encouraging to me when i get feedback like this from people who like the show and find it valuable because it it makes me feel good about what i'm doing it makes me feel like this is time well spent and that i'm accomplishing what i'm trying to accomplish that said i also value constructive criticism if you know of a way that you think that the show could be improved, definitely let me know. GameMastersJourney at gmail.com. I am always looking for ways to improve the show. Case in point, this episode, you know, bringing in uh, you, the listener, into the the show and the content more is something new I'm trying to try to improve the show. So that's the iTunes reviews. I want to start going into listener comments. And again, these are mainly about episode 40 and episode 41. So first I've got some about episode 40. And again, episode 40 was when I discussed elegance in RPGs. And uh, if you haven't listened to that one, definitely go check it out. But in a nutshell, I, I kind of compared and contrasted a few different RPGs and picked out elements from them that I thought were really elegant and then things that weren't so much. And by elegant, I mean ways of mechanically resolving things that come up in a game in a way that is very intuitive and easy for the GM to kind of grok and just be able to to run the system and not have to constantly look things up, but also effective in doing whatever the mechanic is trying to do and having you know, something there that you can really work with. You know, there are systems out there that are extremely simple. um, And I guess in a way you can say that that's elegant, but they're too simple. You know, there's not really much you can do with the system and it's not very um, robust. So that's kind of what I was talking about. So I got got some comments from people. First of all, I got a comment. I guess actually this is a more general comment. I got a comment from Jonathan Breeze on Google Plus who says he just discovered my podcast. I kind of come from the same kind of gaming history as you, right up to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've started from the beginning of of the show and am enjoying it so far. So thank you, Jonathan Breeze, for that comment. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. And um, (laughs) I guess I'm glad you're going back to the beginning. I I always cringe a little when people say that because the beginning of this show wasn't as rough as the beginning of GM Intrusions. But it's still, you know, this is episode 43. I'd like to think this show's better now than it was at episode one. But uh, hopefully I won't lose you in those beginning (laughs) episodes. 
Um, so that's cool. Someone else that, that started out with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. So Dreadmaster uh, left a comment on episode 40. And again, this is regarding the elegance in gaming or RPGs. He says, great episode, Lex. Thank you, Dreadmaster. I think we have similar wants in terms of game mechanics. I have spent many years of my life trying to find the perfect system, trying to find that perfect balance of crunch and elegance. And yes, that that's exactly it. And that was kind of, <laughs> I guess, the thesis of what I was saying in episode 40 is, you know, it's all about finding that balance and for each of us that balance may be different right some of us may like more crunch and some of us may like more simplicity but finding the system that really hits it for you is the trick i think and and once you find that system it's really nice and you kind of want to run everything in that system so yeah good stuff Ryan Wilson also commented on episode 40 on Google Plus. He said, I've been trying to find my personal sweet spot for a long time, and I have yet to find it. D&D 5th edition certainly comes the closest for dice mechanics and actions per turn. And I agree. Uh, For me right now, I I think D&D is kind of uh, my favorite system right now. Um, I'm still getting more experience into uh, Star Wars. So we'll see. Star Wars may take over uh, as I get more experience. I, I It definitely has the potential to. I just don't have enough experience running and playing it yet to know for sure. But yeah, yeah, finding that sweet spot, that's, that's what it's all about. So I will talk a little bit more about the Star Wars system in just a minute. But before I get to that, Texas Beard Company has become a sponsor for Game Master's Journey. They're sponsoring this episode. I use their products and I love their products. I recently, well, recently in January, I decided to grow a beard. And I mean, I've done beards before, like short, you know, Riker beards, but uh, I'd never gone all out to see, you know, what kind of a beard I can really grow. So I decided to grow a beard. You know, one of the big issues people have with growing a beard, and I know I was having this issue in the very beginning, is that it gets really itchy. And I'm the kind of person, like, I I don't cope with itchy well. <laughs> and that would, would have ended the whole beard growing process right there. But I found out that if you oil your beard, that it gets soft and it's not itchy. Uh, So I found Texas Beard Company and was really impressed with them and their products. All of their products are all natural, um, all natural ingredients. They're made by hand in Texas. Specifically, I use their Big Thicket Beard Oil, which among other things has cedar wood and pine needle essential oils. Um, So it's got a nice light foresty scent and I put that on every day and it keeps the beard nice and soft. It doesn't scratch me. My wife loves it. She noticed a huge difference once I started using it. So go check out texasbeardcompany.com. If you use the coupon code GAMEMASTER, you can get a 15% discount on your order. And also you get free shipping on all orders over $25. All right, so getting back to the topic at hand, specifically episode 40 and elegance in gaming, I got an email. I think this was an email. I usually try to write down where this is coming from, uh, but I didn't write it down on this. I think it was an email, but I got some feedback from Sean Phelan. I hope I said that right who says, enjoyed the episode, a few comments came to mind. I've probably played about 15 sessions of Fantasy Flight Games' various Star Wars iterations, mainly Edge of the Empire. Regarding your dice question, and uh, what he's referring to is I was wondering, as you play the system more, if reading the dice gets faster. Because right now, for me, Um, Just getting started, it seems kind of slow when you roll the dice, kind of figuring out how many successes and advantages and things like that you have. So he says, regarding that, reading them definitely gets quicker. It had better since for the first couple sessions, the dice can seem pretty opaque, and this is true. However, in my experience, you're likely only to be able to read them at a glance if the total number of symbols displayed is fairly modest and if the result is pretty lopsided. 
And that makes total sense. And and again, he's referring to, I was wondering if maybe when you get super proficient with the system, if you might be able to throw down your dice and just at a glance, get a good feel for, did you succeed or not um, without having to cancel things and count symbols and stuff. So he's basically saying that, uh, yes, that can happen, but only if your dice pool is pretty small or the number of symbols that come up is pretty small and if it's fairly lopsided, which, which makes sense. With these dice, of course, it's not enough to know if you passed or failed. You still need to know how many advantages and threats, and this is true. I'm definitely a fan of Fantasy Flight's work with it. However, I view the story dice as an advanced tool, and I would agree with that too, requiring notably more from the players and especially the GM. I find the real pitfall not in reading them, that gets much easier, but in their relentless granularity. Particularly when something important is happening, rolling the detailed potential of that big dice pool is awesome. However, it's not like you're rolling comparatively binary percentile dice 75% of the time, and then the GM invokes the dice pool for epic moments. Every test is subject to the same potentially big pool. Everyone has to be on their game, especially the GM, to elegantly narrate that 20th pool of the session with three successes, two threats, and a despair. What I've found typically happens is granularity fatigue eventually sets in and four advantages start getting treated the same as two. I have already seen this myself in my very limited experience. My best take is that the GM really needs to set a major expectation that the players need to carry their weight in dice narrating throughout the entire session. Haven't run any fantasy flight game Star Wars yet and looking forward to the experience. So I completely agree with what Sean says here. He makes a lot of really good points here. This is this is really good stuff. Um, what he calls the relentless granularity of the system is a definite potential problem, I think. And this is something I've already seen in, in my very few experiences, both running and playing the game, is especially after about halfway in the session, it gets a little tedious. You know, it's like he said, you know, if if that kind of thing was reserved for those really climactic, dramatic moments, and then the rest of the time you're you're making some role that's very quickly resolved, then that would be super cool. But the fact is, is that anytime you call for any kind of a role, you have to deal with this system. And yeah, that's great to see if, you know, you're shot against the exhaust pipe of the Death Star is going to hit and blow up the Death Star or not. It's not so great when you're just trying to open a door. Now, obviously, you know, the the biggest thing we can do as GMs to kind of mitigate this in the system is to only call for roles when it's important or when it's um, dramatic, right? And if it's something relatively simple or if it's something that you don't want to deal with that dice pool thing, then just don't call for a roll. But the thing is, is, you know, a lot of times GMs like to call for roles for things just to kind of get a feel for what's going on. And I do that a lot myself. For instance, you as a a player may want to do a thing and it's not so much a question of can you do it or not. And I do this in every game I run. I I do it in D&D too. To me, it's a question of how well does it go? So you you may try to do something like, I want to climb that hill, right? And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, there's no chance that you're going to fail. You're definitely going to climb the hill. However, I'm going to have you roll just to see maybe how long does it take you or how graceful at it are you? Or is there a chance maybe you knock down a rock that hits someone below you or something? Like usually I have kind of something in mind. So I want to see how well you do. And even if you quote unquote fail that role, you're not going to fail at climbing the hill. Just something interesting might happen. And with a game like D&D, like that's really easy to do. It doesn't slow down game at all because you you make the role, you see what the number is and, and you go on. But with 
the Star Wars system, especially if you have more advanced characters with big dice pools and you're throwing in all these setback dice and boost dice and upgrading and downgrading and all this stuff, they're rolling like 20 dice or something and you got to sort through all that and figure all that out just for someone to climb a hill, which for me, um, you know, I haven't run it a lot yet. I'm, I'm going to be starting a campaign soon, hopefully. I think is going to lead to me just not doing that in this game and unless I feel that it's not going to hurt the momentum to deal with this role for something relatively, you know, simple or straightforward. I'm probably just going to narrate it and and not call for roles unless I absolutely have to. So yeah, I think that's a definite uh, potential pitfall of the system and I think each GM is going to have to figure out his or her own way to mitigate that. And I also agree with what Sean says here that as a GM running this system, you really need to ask your players to step up and the players need to step up in interpreting those dice because if the GM has to do all of it or even 50% of it, the GM is going to be not happy by the end of the session or at the very least worn out. So Sean goes on to say, understandably, dice mechanics represented a significant part of your system survey. The vast majority of my role play experience is over roll 20, so I couldn't help but think about its effect on some of your comments. On roll 20, there's no counting. All dice are sorted and mathematically resolved for you, or not, if that's what you want. Extensive macros can be created to automatically deal with many or most modifiers, or at least equipped with automatic reminders about details regarding whatever mechanic is in play. And that's all without making any use of Roll20's API, which opens another big door of options. So I responded uh, to this to Sean, and now that I think about it, I think this was actually on Google+. Plus. I think it might have been in the comments on the episode in the Game Master's Journey Google Plus community, if you want to go check it out. But I, I do agree that, that it kind of changes the landscape a, a bit if you're using something like Roll20, because like he says, you know, dice rolling is pretty much a click of the button, especially if you use macros and the API and things like that. But I, I do still think, and I think this is what I said to him, I, I do still think it does have some bearing. For instance, you know, if I'm going to run a game like Numenera, well, first of all, I don't even use Roll20 for Numenera because it has a bunch of features that I don't need. And I'd much rather use Google Hangouts to run Numenera because it's a much better uh, video conferencing than Roll20. And I just vastly prefer it to, to Roll20 for a lot of different reasons. I could do a whole episode on that. But I will use Hangouts, which has a very simple dice app. You can't even add modifiers to it, although I, I've seen that that may be coming in the future to d developers starting to work on it some more. So it does have an impact because if I'm rolling new or if I'm running Numenera, I'm, I'm going to use Hangouts. And in fact, when I run Numenera, I tend to not even use the dice app at all. And I just let players roll their own dice at home um, because I think that's more fun. And with a game like Numenera, there's, there's no real downside to it as long as you trust your players to be honest. However, with a game like Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, that I roll or I run in Roll20 because of the fact that the dice roller in Hangouts does not add bonuses. So if you're rolling the 1d6 plus 2, it can't do the plus 2 and Roll20 does. And also because of the advantage disadvantage mechanic, you know, that could be a little confusing with the simpler dice roller and hangouts and roll 20, you can make macros to, to do it for you. And, and just, you know, D and is a little bit more robust of a system. There's more to it. So I found the functionality of having the character sheet and being able to just click buttons on your character sheet to make all kinds of different roles just with a click instead of having to type in you know what you want the thing to roll or click and select your dice like you do in hangouts um i found it it's easier um in roll 20. so i i think it affects it a little bit in that way and also if you're running a game like that in roll 20 yeah once you have all your macros and your apis and everything set up it's really fast and much faster than rolling physical dice but you do have to set those up which will add a little bit to your initial prep time for the campaign for you as GM. 
but yeah, that definitely does make a difference playing online. And finally, I have a comment from Bill Payne on episode 41. And episode 41 was an unplugged episode where I talked about Titan's Grave and what I learned from watching Will Wheaton run it. Bill says, hi, I'm an old gamer from the Dark Ages and I appreciate your podcast very much. Thank you, Bill. I've only listened to the last couple, but I intend to go through some of the older ones as well. Awesome. I just started a fantasy campaign GMing for my daughter and a couple of friends. We've been using Pathfinder. Although I like the writing of their adventures and the quality of their products overall, I agree. I've had to sort of abridge the rules so that I I can manage it and keep the flow of the game from bogging down and calculating bonuses and dice rolls. I feel you. (laughs) Feel your pain. My daughter and I have enjoyed Titan's Fall and I decided to pick up Fantasy Age. And Fantasy Age is the system that Titan's Fall uses, which just recently came out. So far, I really like the simplicity and quality. It reminds me of the old days when I felt comfortable enough with the rules that I could GM smoothly, and it's only been a week. Well, that's a good sign. It's refreshing to work with a simple yet comprehensive system, and it fits my old school style. No need for minis on a grid, which is always a plus. I often worked with minis in the old days, but it was as much for atmosphere as for envisioning encounters. I liked your podcast where you compared and critiqued various systems. While I've not looked closely at 5th edition or Fate, I think your concern that rolling three dice rather than one d20 doesn't carry much weight for me. So he's uh, discussing the when I was talking about Titan's Grave, I was a little iffy on the fact that they're rolling three six-sideds to resolve things instead of a d20. Um, Just because to me, it seems like uh, an unnecessary kind of slowing of things, having to roll and count up three dice instead of just one. But, you know, that is probably one of those things that you play the game enough and it becomes pretty automatic. But I do know people who do not like math, do not like adding numbers, even small ones. And to a person like that, that would be a downside. And I would much rather have them just roll 1d20 and see their number and not have to add things together. But uh, yeah, I I could definitely see for for a lot of us, especially those of us that aren't bothered so much by math, that you know, with some practice that 3d6 gets just as fast or nearly as fast as, as rolling a d20. He says, I like that the one test roll also indicates the possibility and degree of a stunt or critical without further rolling aside from damage. And that is one thing about the system that I do think is cool. You know, if you're going to do 3D6, uh, the interesting things happen when you roll doubles and triples and, and stuff like that. That's kind of an interesting way to do that. Anyway, happy gaming, stay frosty, and thanks for the podcast. Well, you are welcome, Bill. Thank you for your message. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm glad you're you're liking Fantasy Age. Now, one question I, I have for you and anyone else who's played Fantasy Age is what are the difficulties like? Is it kind of like D&D where you have difficulty 5, 10, 15, and 20? Or are they more granular? Because I know when I was watching... Uh, will run Titan's Grave, he was handing out like difficulty 13 and difficulty 18. So maybe that's just his game or how he was running it. Um, but to me, that seems like false precision, you know, and, and I really like how D&D just broke it down into a few difficulties that you need to worry about. And you don't need to worry about, oh, is this a difficulty five or a six or a seven? I don't know. You know, it's a lot to... Uh, to, it's too fiddly for me, um, especially since I think uh, kind, kind of like what we talked about a few minutes ago with, you know, two advantage and four advantage and Star Wars quickly becoming kind of the same thing. Um, I think a six and a seven difficulty is quickly going to become the same thing, in which case, why have all these different difficulties? So I'm, I'm curious if that's part of the fantasy age or if maybe that's just specific to Titan's Grave or even just the way that Will does it. I'm curious. So there is some feedback on a couple previous episodes from the show. Some really interesting conversation here, and I'm really glad to hear from people. 
with further ideas about the topic. So if you have any thoughts about either of these topics, elegance in gaming, or thoughts on the Titan's Grave or Fantasy Age systems, definitely let me know, gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. Or if you have any feedback or anything to say at all, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, you may give me some more things to talk about on the show, which I really appreciate. Well, that's going to wrap up episode 43 of Game Master's Journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you would like to reach me, you can email me at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. Follow me on Google Plus, search for Lex Starwalker, and follow me on Twitter at Lex Starwalker. Visit the website starwalkerstudios.com slash gamemastersjourney where you can find the show notes for this episode, episode 43. You can also find links to all of the great ways you can support the show, including our Patreon button, our donate button, iTunes and Stitcher buttons. If you want to leave your review or subscribe, they'll take you right there. At the bottom of the show notes, you'll find a link to our Google Plus community. Love it if you join us, join us there. You can find links to my YouTube and Twitch channels. I am streaming games twice a week right now and uh, I used to stream them on Twitch I'm gonna have to switch to Google Hangouts slash YouTube to stream them now because my internet here my new internet sucks uh, and is not good enough to stream to Twitch although I think the problem is actually either with Twitch or with the software I'm using because I can stream to Google Hangouts just fine or at least I think I can so far so if you want to watch those, you can go to my YouTube channel. Again, it's linked at the bottom of the show notes. There's a YouTube button. Uh, I've got lots of D&D actual play there, Numenera actual play. I recently ran the Force and Destiny beginner box, and that video is up as well. Also at the bottom of the show notes, you can find our free 30-day trial of Audible books. You can find our Amazon referral link and yeah all that great stuff is in the show notes and also at starwalkerstudios.com you can find all my other great podcasts that i produce and once again i want to thank my new sponsor texas beer company for sponsoring this show i really appreciate it and i hope that you listener have a chance to play your favorite rpg this week i will be back next week with another episode of game master's journey until then Game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music provided by Cloudwalker, Renfield, Transboy, and Ish. Please see the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey.